When it comes to making antique muzzle loading propellant, one of the most important components is the charcoal, or carbon source as we usually call it. The reason why it's important is because the charcoal is the fuel that burns in the mix of what black powder is. It's the fuel, it is what burns. And like running lousy fuel in your car, if you have lousy fuel, you're gonna get lousy performance. Same principle with black powder. So it's important to get a good charcoal. Now we've tested a lot of different carbon sources, good and bad, and we have some that we like to stick with. But when it comes to making charcoal, we've done it a few different ways. When we first started this, we'd just make a fire outside, take our paint can with a hole in it, put our wood in there, and throw it right on top of a big roaring fire. And after around 15 minutes or 20 minutes, it'd be done venting out of that hole, and we'd pluck it out of there, and it'd be done. Now, over the years, we have found that charcoal that was done slower and at a lower temperature gave us better performance. It was cleaner, and it gave us better velocities as far as our powder finished powder went. And so we tried using a propane burner like a turkey fryer and monitoring the temperature outside, and that worked okay. But what we ended up settling on, mostly because it's easy, is just taking our paint can and throwing it in the wood stove after there's nothing but coals in there and leaving it until the next day. And that worked Okay, but the reason why we wanted to try and get a little bit more control and a little bit more scientific about making charcoal is it's really one of the last variables that we can't really control. So we wanted to try and make something that gave us some temperature control and something we could monitor, let's sit there for a couple hours or whatever, just so we can get a little bit more scientific. So what we have made is something that we like to call the pyrolysizer. And basically what it is, is an electric kiln, that's all. Now, if you're wondering what pyrolysizer is, it makes uh, pyrolysis happen. Now, pyrolysis is basically when you heat up something in an oxygen-free environment to turn it into char or some form of carbon. In this case, our oxygen-free environment is our one gallon paint can. So, here's how it went. So for this particular project, we needed to order a few things. The first thing we ordered were these bricks that are specifically used for kilns. They're made for high temperature kilns. I don't know what they're made out of, but the material looks very porous. But we started laying it out in a particular configuration that we thought might work and uh, started slapping it together. Now the stuff we use is this high temperature refractory cement, which they said is used for fireplaces and things like that. So we mixed it up and started sticking it together. Now, just in case you didn't notice, neither Derek or I have any bricklaying or masonry experience. I know you probably couldn't tell. Well, that looks like hammered shit. Yeah, that we are not professional masonries or bricklayers or... Um, no, we're, we're not even hobbyists. No, not even close. Yeah, so we, we have all kinds of excuses why this looks like dog shit. Uh, but Derek assures me that it'll still work just the same. So if it doesn't work, it's entirely his fault. I did? Well, either it was you or the voices in my head. <laughs> Initially, we were going to use this 10 gauge heating element for our kiln and we were just going to wrap it around the inside and staple it up against the walls, kind of, kind of like a coil spring going from top to bottom. But after it dried, we were afraid that it would come apart once we had to move it. So we ended up taking it to the shop and building basically a cage out of angle iron. So if it did want to fall apart, at least it could still kind of hold together enough to work. So after that, we cut into it with a screwdriver. You could see the lines in there. So we could put that heating element in there, wrapping it around, which seemed to work out pretty good. Now we had to add this tube here for our retort because we're going to stick a flat piece of insulation on top of it. And that had to come out 
the top, which you'll see here in just a second. So after we poked some holes and got it all set up, it was time to give it a try. Now, the other part of this we had to order was a Variac. Now, a Variac allows you to control the voltage to our heating element, which is how we're going to control the temperature. Okay, we're back. Switch on. Right now we are at zero. Okay. You ready now? Is this volts? Uh, yes, Amp. this this shows volts alternating current. Okay. So let's bring her up to 60. <laughs> I told you it was gonna pop that. You know why I popped the breaker? Why? Because we're coming out of a fucking 100 foot extension cord. Ah, uh, okay. You hear it hum? Oh yeah, I heard it. I heard it. All right, well, the good news is it didn't flip our breaker. And uh, they must have known what we were planning on doing because they give you plenty of spares, so. So after a couple more fuses and checking some math, we found that with that particular size wire being 10 gauge and that length, we would need a 55 amp Variac and ours is only good for 20. So as cool and nice as this arrangement looks in here, it just wasn't gonna work in this particular application. So what we ended up doing was getting a smaller diameter heating element and trying that instead. All right, so we have a new kind of heating coil, yeah? Yep, these it are- looks like that. Iron, chromium, and aluminum heating elements. Well, that sounds neat. They're, um, these are legit heating elements that you use, check it out, they come like this. What are you, uh, what were you running it at? I was a full tilt four. All the way? Oh yeah, it'll take it. All the way up, man. Ramp her all the way up. So after we got our new heating coil installed, we put the lid on, we put our temperature probe in there and turned it all the way up and just monitored the temp. And at first it didn't look like we were going to be able to get hot enough, even with the Variac turned all the way up. But after about 10 minutes, it did start to heat up slowly but surely. And you can see those coils do get red hot, and as soon as you take that lid off, the temperature just plummets, and I suppose rightfully so. So it's very important to have the lid pushed all the way on and not to crack it at all because you definitely start losing heat. But slowly but surely, the temperature did continue to rise. It did take about a half hour to come up to temperature. As soon as we got to about 400 degrees, you could see it starts to smoke out of that vent, which means it's having the pyrolysizing effect that we're shooting for. So after about 25 or 30 minutes, we were right about 500 degrees and still climbing, which was perfect. As you can see, it's starting to smoke. And once we got to about 550, we backed the Variac down a little bit and we were able to maintain a temperature of anywhere between 550 and 580, which worked out really well. This stuff was steaming and smoking really good. And that's something that I probably dislike about this particular method is when you just throw it in the fireplace, you don't have to worry about the smoke. Now, I am doing this at my shop, but my shop is open on both sides, and so it's not really that bad, but it's not something you wanna breathe in. So after two hours of cooking at a temperature of anywhere between 550 and 580, which was right on target for what we were shooting for, this stuff was done. And so we turned the Variac off and we just let it sit until it was cool enough to handle. Uh, average. There's our average temp right there? Yep, five, five, uh, 559. Good. So. We'll round up and call it 560. Sounds good. All right, so this stuff has been charred for two hours now. We're holding at 578. It's not smoking anymore. Well, maybe just an 80 bit, but I think that's good enough. So we're going to turn it off and just let it sit. All right, so here it is afterward. I've got the cap on our deal there. It is still very, very warm in there. So, looks like it worked out pretty well. So after it was cool enough to handle, we popped it open and had a look, and this stuff looks beautiful. 
This particular wood happens to be cotton wood, which I've never tried before, but we'll see how it goes. Now, one of the things about making charcoal that I find is pretty important is your wood or whatever it is that you're charring needs to be pretty close in size. It needs to be about the same length and about the same width, as close as you can get it. That way it does cook evenly. But as you can see, this stuff turned out very, very nice. Well, that looks like it worked out pretty well. Now, so far we have charred up the cottonwood and some bamboo. I know a lot of people have been wanting to see bamboo, and so I finally got some, and we're going to make some powder. That'll be coming out in another week, maybe two. So, so there. Overall, it appears to work just like we hoped, which seems kind of rare that that happens. But great, I'll take it just the same. It looked like it wasn't going to be able to get up to a hot enough temperature, but after a half hour of it sitting there with the lid on, it'll get way over 600 degrees if you let it. In fact, I don't have any video of this, but when I was doing the bamboo, I let it go a little too long and it got right up to 600 and I had to crack the lid on it to bring the temperature down. So I really can't say if this is going to make a tremendous difference in performance or fouling or anything, but really what it allows us to do is to just have control over how we make the charcoal. So far, we're going to make it all, but we'll experiment a little bit to see what's better or what's not. But as of right now, we're going for a target temperature of 575 Fahrenheit for two hours. Both of the things we've charred, both the cottonwood and the bamboo, two hours in, it is plenty done. It probably would be okay after an hour, and we'll experiment with that moving forward. But as of right now, that's what we're shooting for. Two hours at a target temp of about 575. And that worked out really well. After it comes up to about 550, we could roll it back, the very act that is, back to around 95 or 100, and it'll maintain that temperature. So far, again, it works pretty damn swell. So I don't have any powder made yet. You'll have to stick around for next week when you'll see that powder that's made with the pyrolysizer. So uh, hopefully that's not too disappointing for you. But as far as making scientific charcoal goes, I think this qualifies. So as usual, folks, if you thought this video didn't suck, do me a favor and hit the like button and consider subscribing. And if you did think it sucked, go make your own damn video.